Hi, this is Dr. Diane Gayhard, and this is my lecture on Emotionally Focused Couple and Family Therapy. And this lecture goes with my textbook series, Mastering Competencies, specifically the text Mastering Competency in Family Therapy, as well as Theory and Treatment Planning in Family Therapy. So EFT is an evidence-based treatment, and before I go on to describe the actual treatment, I thought I would begin by addressing some myths and concerns people uh, frequently have about evidence-based treatments. Evidence-based treatments are, they are manualized treatments that have been designed to treat a specific population or problem. And so in the case of EFT, it is designed to treat couple and family um, problems, basically. And so, and, and in specific forms of those problems, we'll talk about that uh, in depth. And so, so they are manualized. So sometimes people have this vision that a manualized treatment is um, has certain qualities. And so I just wanted to go over and, and address those in case you have some of those myths still in your head. The first is, in this age of evidence-based treatments, we don't need traditional theories anymore. And when you'll see as we go through this lecture on EFT that EFT is a theory and it actually integrates three other commonly known theories and, and have put those uh, theories together in a way that the evidence shows is uh, particularly effective in treating uh, couple and family distress. And so, yes, you still need theory. In fact, you probably need to be trained in more theories in this uh, age of evidence-based treatments and to be comfortable with uh, moving between different approaches uh, depending on the population you're working with. And as we develop more of an evidence base in the area of family therapy and psychotherapy more generally, it'll probably be required that all of us get, uh, not just pick our favorite theory or personal little theory of choice, but that we learn how to get good at a range of theories. Uh, the other myth is that MFT theories and research are separable. The two inform each other. There's no researcher out there developing a research approach, an evidence-based treatment that's not grounded in theory. And MFT theories all began from observational research. And so those uh, theory and research in the world, especially in the 21st century, are going to be two sides of the same coin as we move forward. And so... Uh, practitioners are going to have to get better at understanding and using research and researchers you know are going to need to focus their research on um, applicable um, applicable treatments for uh, populations in the real world there's also a myth out there that evidence-based treatments are rigid and robotic and you have no freedom and they're extremely limiting and this is simply not true and I, I had that um, myth in my head when I actually went to my first uh, four-day in-depth training, the externship for EFT, and I uh, quickly learned that that is simply not the case. In fact, there are areas uh, for the EFT that are more flexible uh, than other systemic approaches in terms of how they track the interactional sequence. And so they're just like any other approach. There are certain places where it's more uh, kind of prescriptive that you need to have some prescription for it to be a valid theory. And there are other places that are much more, there is uh, more flexibility and it's just different than other approaches. So it's not necessarily more rigid or robotic than any other tra uh, recognized traditional treatment out there. Another theory is that you have to give up your personal theory of choice to use an evidence-based treatment. I just simply don't think that's possible. Um, in the sense that, you know, as you train to be a therapist, you're normally trained in one or two models that you closely identify with. You, you learn to see people and problems through those lenses. And the evidence-based treatments simply get added and integrated into this. And you learn to have just a more sophisticated, multi-layered, multi-faceted practice. And that the evidence-based treatments inform that. Another common myth is that researchers agree on what is, uh, constitutes the research or the evidence base for the field. And there are actually multiple uh, strands of research. And I describe these in some of my uh, chapters in the books associated with, these, with this series. But suffice it to say that not even everyone agree, all the researchers agree on what constitutes you know, valid research and meaningful research in the field. There's also a myth that cognitive behavioral therapy is the only evidence-based treatment. And if you're 
Conversely, if you're doing cognitive behavioral, it's evidence-based for everything. Again, that is simply not true. Cognitive behavioral therapies have the most recognized evidence-based treatments associated with them, but they certainly don't have it for everything. And uh, for example, um, with teenage conduct and substance abuse disorders, there are systemic structural approaches are really what the research shows are the primary um, approach for those. And EFT is another wonderful example of where it's, it's not a CBT. It is a more humanistic approach and it has a very strong evidence base associated with it. So no, not every, um, not every evidence-based treatment is cognitive behavioral and cognitive behavioral therapy is not evidence-based treatment for every possible presenting problem. And then finally, the last myth is that standard practice is up to date. And so you'll hear some therapists say, well, we've been doing it this way for years. It's been good enough till now. Um, the, both in physical medicine and in psychotherapy, what constitutes standard practice has historically been about 17 years to 20 years, depending on what study you're looking at, behind um, the current evidence base. So standard practice is typically about 20 years behind. And you can imagine how uh, when people hear this, uh, maybe people outside the field, stakeholders, people who are paying for this or receiving the services, would like to narrow that gap. And that's a, a major priority, both in the fields of physical health, as well as mental health and behavioral health. And so that is an overall goal. And some of what these um, evidence-based treatments are trying to do is to make the current evidence base more readily available to the everyday practitioner to close the gap so that standard practice is closer to the current state of knowledge in the field. And for the rest of this lecture we're going to focus on, I'm going to focus on introducing you to emotionally focused couple and family therapy. In a nutshell, the least you need to know. So EFT uh, originally actually began uh, with the work of Sue Johnson and Les Greenberg and uh, each has kind of focused on their own uh, variation with Les Greenberg working more at an individual with individuals and Sue Johnson working more with couples and families and so this workshop is really going to focus on the work of the later work of Sue Johnson um, although certainly uh, Les Greenberg and Sue Johnson started out with these ideas together and EFT is an integrative approach approach that combines uh, attachment theory, experiential therapy theory, and systems theory. And you'll see all three of these in action together. And the focus really is on conceptualizing couples as, and families as emotional systems that have both interpersonal and intrapsychic uh, processes, systemic processes that inter, interrelate and interact. And if you've listened to the systemic lectures in this series, you will uh, be you will recognize the interactional sequence and so Sue Johnson focuses on the interactional sequence between couples and families has uh, found very easy ways to actually assess these are relatively easy compared to maybe some of the traditional approaches and and in, and conceptualizes it using attachment theory as well as experiential and so you will see many uh, of the traditional elements of a systemic approach adding in attachment theory with some humanistic elements, particularly in how she intervenes. And so most of the research with EFT has been conducted with couples. Uh, this has been extensively researched with couples for over three decades. And so, but many of these principles are, can also be used uh, in family therapy and it's definitely has been studied with families, but most of the research has been with couples. And it's one of the two uh, readily identified evidence-based treatments for distressed couples, uh, this along with um, integrative behavioral couples therapy. Those are the two evidence primary evidence-based treatments for couples. So next we're going to talk about the JUICE, which is one of the most significant contributions of this theory to the field of mental health in general. The one thing that Sue Johnson does in this EFT theory that is truly unique is that she has applied attachment theory, which has primarily been used with infants and young children from you know one to three, one to five, and applied that theory to adult love. 
and she is really a leader in this area of applying attachment theory to adults and developing an intervention based on this. And so, as you may recall from some introductory psych classes, that uh, attachment research and attachment theory is about the, both the physiological, emotional, and survival needs that we've always known or have known for a very long time in psychology, let's say, that an infant needs to f literally physically survive in this world. And Sue Johnson uh, and, and is a leader in uh, identifying adult attachment theory and that adults have the same need for secure relationships to feel emotionally safe, to uh, help them regulate their emotions, and uh, for adult health. And there's a, a lot of um, evidence also that shows that adults really do need to have secure attachments to, uh, it, it enhances their, uh, both their quality and length of life. And so this has been an exciting place, both in physical as well as mental health research, looking at adult uh, attachment. And the whole heart of her theory is, is based on, on this conceptualization, this understanding that adult attachment is as necessary in couple relationships as the primary driving factor in understanding couple relationships. And it, it helps to make sense of what is often very confusing um, when we look at couple relationships. Next, let's talk about the big picture, an overview of what treatment looks like in EFT. Now, as you may remember, EFT is an evidence-based treatment, and you may recall it is manualized. And so, yes, there are very concrete stages and steps that go with EFT that help the uh, therap therapist navigate treatment, monitor progress, and basically structure the treatment as efficiently as possible. And so it's this outline that is used in the evidence-based studies. So in the first stage is the de-escalation of the negative cycle, and this involves four different steps. And the, the first step is for the therapist to create an alliance um, and identify the attachment struggle with the couple. And so this is kind of developing a very uh, important therapeutic alliance that will be relied on quite heavily, as you see, um, because it is a very emotionally intense approach. And so this is an ex so the therapist has to create an extremely safe therapeutic environment for the couple or all members of the family. And so that's a very important process. Then the next step is to identify the negative cycle. And this is basically tracking the interactional uh, sequence, which we do in the more traditional forms of systemic approaches. Very similar tracking that systemic interna interactional cycle. cycle. Um, Step three is accessing unacknowledged emotions and positions. And we'll be talking about um, secondary emotion and primary emotion. So this, the secondary emotions are the ones we uh, most readily recognize. We're angry, we're frustrated, we feel attacked, um, we feel defensive. So those are the secondary emotions. Those are usually the first ones that are readily identified by the couple or family when they're presenting the problem. Then you'll see there's a period where you go and you track the primary emotions, and those are the attachment-based emotions. That's the longing for connection, the wanting to feel safe. Those emotions then get tracked. So first you identify the negative interaction cycle, both in terms of behaviors as well as what is called secondary emotion. And then you go back through and you track the primary attachment emotions underneath that. And then finally, in stage one, you reframe the presenting problem that the couple has in terms of attachment and the negative cycle. And to a certain extent, this externalizes the problem uh, in, instead of, you know, the problem is that my wife nags or the problem is that my husband withdraws. Now, the, in step four, we get the couple to see, and I'll use couples as the primary example, that the problem is not his or her behaviors, but that the couple has a very negative interaction cycle that they get into. And when they get into this, it triggers uh, their attachment fears. And so they get into these kind of survival positions in order to kind of manage the threat to uh, what feels like they're, uh, that, they're no, that their partner is no longer a safe attachment figure, essentially. So basically, this negative interaction cycle happens when one or both partners begins to perceive the other as no longer being safe. Then in stage two is um, 
is where you begin to change this negative interactional pattern and create emotional engagement and emotional safety. You repair uh, the attachment or strengthen the attachment uh, for the couple or family. So uh, typically you go through step five, six, and seven. Uh, you start with the partner who tends to withdraw. And I think this is one of Sue Johnson's most brilliant contributions. It must have come out through the uh, research because I don't think it's intuitive because the pursuer is the one who's usually complaining, who wants connection, and the withdrawer is the one who's kind of pulling away, wanting distance. Because the pursuer is usually the one complaining, most of us naturally start with the one who's complaining because the withdrawer will also often not have too many complaints. And what Sue Johnson has found is that if you begin with the person who is withdrawing from connection um, and you re-engage that person, you make them feel safe again, you make them feel present, then the pursuer doesn't need to pursue because the other person's open and available emotionally. And so she generally will begin this process with the person who tends to withdraw more in the interactional sequence get them re-engaged and then bring, uh, then work with the pursuer. So step five is you promote the identification of disowned attachment needs. So that's working um, first with the pursuer, then the with, no, first with the withdrawer, then with the pursuer on identifying their attachment needs and expressing those to their partner in an open, direct, congruent way. Then in step six, you promote the acceptance of that partner's experience um, by, you know, so the, for example, the withdrawer is ex uh, expressing, we'll say, his needs, then his partner would need to acknowledge and accept that, um, accept that, and then step seven is having direct expression of the needs while strengthening attachment. Um, and, and so you would do this with both partners as often as necessary to get them kind of reconnected and out of that negative interactional pattern. And then in stage three, you're facilitating new solutions to those old problems. And in step nine, you consolidate the new positions and attachments. And this does not happen in a perfectly linear way. Uh, most clients are going to move back and forth. Um, it's more fluid than the nine steps. It's not, you know, literally a checkbook thing. But this is generally, this is the basic progression and how therapists uh, conceptualize and move through and track progress. And because of this very clear uh, outline of the therapy process, it's very clear when uh, therapy is not progressing or it isn't working because you can see you're stuck, you know, in stage three or four and you're not moving past or moving, you know, into the next uh, step or stage. And so in, in EFT, there are three primary therapeutic tasks. Uh, the first is creating and maintaining the therapeutic alliance with both partners or all members of the family, which is extremely challenging when working with couples and families in such an intense and intimate way. The second task uh, is assessing and formulating emotion, so understanding that primary and secondary level of, of emotion and how they're interacting. And then the third task is restructuring the problem interaction uh, cycles that the couple is, or family is stuck in. So those are the three critical tasks uh, that are the focus of EFT treatment. So now we're going to move on to making connection and developing the therapeutic relationship in EFT. And overall, you'll notice that the relationship in this approach is very much grounded in humanistic principles, and it requires uh, a lot of the therapist. It's a very actually intense uh, therapeutic relationship. If you get a chance to watch uh, Sue Johnson in action or any EFT therapist in action, you will notice that there's a very particular therapeutic relationship and that the therapist is exceptional in terms of empath empathic attunement with the client and expression of empathy. And often you will notice that the therapist uh, speaking and engaging the clients um, in a very particular way. And so EFT is not an approach where the therapist kind of remains aloof, emotionally detached. The therapist is right there with the client, feeling and tuning into not just the surface level emotions, but those very primary attachment needs and putting into words these very primary attachment needs um, that often the client almost experiences without language sometimes, and the therapist is sometimes putting this into words for the client for the first time. Uh, 
the approach very much relies on a lot of the principles that Carl Rogers introduced, such as genuineness and acceptance of the client. The therapist will often use self-disclosure, just like other humanistic uh, therapists, as a way to talk about emotion, share about emotion, help clients explore emotion. And because it is an extremely intimate and emotionally intense relationship, there is a constant monitoring of the alliance, making sure that the therapist is both aligned with the uh, with all members of the therapeutic system, so uh, each of the partners and or all members of the family system. There is still the concept of joining the system, um, learning to talk and interact in ways um, that are comfortable for them. And the therapist's role is very much that of not just being empathetically attuned, um, but helping the clients uh, learn how to work with these very difficult emotions that we all have in our most intimate relationships. I mean, anyone who's human, I think, has been paying attention. Um, but our relationships with family and partners are both some of the most wonderful and some of the most deep and painful emotions one can experience. And so the EFT therapist is right there with clients in all of that, in a, in a very intense and intimate way. So next we're going to move on to talking about the viewing, case conceptualization, and assessment in EFT. And here you're going to see um, a lot of the attachment theory as well as the systemic case conceptualization that they use to understand the dynamics and where couples and families get stuck. So in EFT, uh, they are very conscious about assessing both intrapsychic, how individuals are processing their experiences, particularly focusing on key attachment-oriented uh, emotional responses, so their attachment patterns, as well as looking at the interpersonal, interactional patterns about how two partners or a family organize into both negative and positive interaction cycles. And so the therapist is constantly monitoring what's going on within the individuals emotionally as well as how they are interacting to create the broader systemic dynamics. So primary and secondary emotions, as I mentioned earlier, play a significant role in the conceptualization in EFT. So as I mentioned earlier, primary emotions typically represent attachment fears and needs. So these are usually softer, more vulnerable emotions. You, you fear abandonment from somebody else. You want to be attached. You're afraid to show your true self to somebody else. These are generally very vulnerable emotions and fears of being rejected and also the fear of needing someone. For a lot of people, that's a very scary to acknowledge that you need someone else to be okay or that you, you know, to have a sense of being okay, that you want someone else in a very, uh, and that you need them at that emotional attachment level, especially um, for those who come from cultures where there's a sense of independence and I, you know, it's, you know, and I, I can take care of myself. I don't need someone else. And there's, you know, often gender uh, men tend to have more of that, uh, at least in Western American society uh, than women. But this idea that I, I can be totally independent, I don't need anyone else. And so these emotions can be particularly difficult to even just recognize because of social cultural norms. The secondary emotions are our emotions about the primary pro emotions, and they often take the form of anger, frustration, withdrawal. Um, and so these secondary emotions allow you to not feel the sense of vulnerability associated with those primary emotions. And so if you can get angry and frustrated, um, you don't feel the, 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 the scarier emotions of being vulnerable, of being abandoned. That often feels worse. So we, we are, tend to be more conscious of these secondary emotions. And so early on in therapy, we, be, uh, we track, like I mentioned, the uh, secondary emotions because that's what the clients initially present. And once that becomes clear and those patterns are clear, then you can go back in and try to begin to identify and have clients identify with those more primary uh, emotions, which are much more difficult to access for most people. So if you've been following along in the text, um, you will no maybe remember earlier on uh, the uh, traditional systemic approaches like MRI, Milan, and Strategic 
they assessed a negative interaction cycle. And Sue Johnson does this also in EFT. But the way she does it is, quite frankly, a bit easier. Because she focuses on, ultimately, if you conceptualize around adult attachment needs, there is one partner who's pursuing for attachment and another person who's withdrawn. And that's the basic dynamics, at least at how relationships start. Because, and, and this still fits with traditional systemic theory that there's a, the pursue withdraw has always been viewed as there's only a certain amount of intimacy a, a couple, a given couple can tolerate. And so that even uh, when we were looking at first and second order change, they can pursue, you can flip who's pursuing with, and withdrawing, but the same level of Intimacy is generally tolerated. It takes a major second order intervention to shift how much uh, intimacy can be tolerated within the couple. So typically the pursuer um, protests any type of separation or distancing in relationship. And so this tends to be associated with a more anxious attachment style. And so the emotions that this person typically feels is feeling hurt, feeling alone, um, and feeling unwanted by their partner. The withdrawer it tends to distance, protect himself from whatever perceived lack of safety uh, that they're seeing in the relationship. And this person tends to have a, this is typical of the avoidant attachment style. This person typically feels rejected, inadequate, or judged by the pursuer. And so you typically get that pattern. It is possible, particularly uh, if one of the partners has been traumatized, that they can actually flip uh, flip roles in the cycle, and so you get almost like a figure eight, I think of it, but one pursues and the other distances, and then as part of their cycle, that actually changes, and then that flips around, and then they actually flip roles within the same kind of argument or cycle that they go through. It tends to be indicative of trauma, according to um, Sue Johnson's research, but you can just, if you just track this pattern, um, and this is the basic pattern, who's pursuing for closeness and who's withdrawn. And, and this can uh, change. I always like to joke that typically you can uh, assess this relatively quickly because usually it's the pursuer who's calling to set up the therapy appointment, unless the pursuer just threatened divorce, in which case the withdrawer would be picking up the phone to call you. But that's generally, uh, I joke about that, I say that jokingly, but I encourage you, if you use this approach, to consider that. Um, as you uh, take your intake phone calls and tell me uh, if that seems to match up with your experience because that's been my experience. So early on in the therapeutic relationship, the uh, EFT therapist will do an attachment history if they're working with a couple or family. And often this is done in individual sessions. Uh, usually there's a single individual assessment uh, with each partner. And what they get, try to get is a sense of what was their attachment like with their primary caregivers and as an adults and as adolescents and intimate relationship that they had in their uh, early dating years or wherever their dating years, whatever phase of adulthood they're in. And so you want to look at the various attachment, major attachment figures they've had in their life and what have been their patterns. What has been, uh, in particular, uh, that person's experience in terms of secure attachment, avoidant, and anxious attachments. And, and so as part of this, you're looking for, you know, how accessible were the other people, how responsive and how engaged are they used to experiencing in their intimate relationships. Another thing that EFT therapists assess for is something that's called an attachment injury. And they're looking for a, a significant attachment event. So, and what this means is that in a moment of high need, uh, such as when a woman is pregnant, or uh, a partner lost their parent, that the other partner did not offer support in this moment of particularly high need. And so this is a very specific type of betrayal or abandonment um, or a sense of violation in the relationship. And this fundamentally redefines the relationship for the injured party as unsafe. And so this is something that the EFT therapist assesses for, and this needs to be identified and addressed um, before moving on to the second stage of intervention. And so certainly if uh, the therapy process becomes stuck, uh, this is something that they would look for to see if they missed one of these, but it's also something assessed for early in the relationship to get a sense, because that needs to be repaired, and yes, they have a specific process for that. Um, 
but but that's something that they're assessing here to, and repairing this if it needs to be in order before they can move into the more intense work of the second stage. So in terms of the initial assessment sessions, which I alluded to a couple slides ago, is that there is an initial assessment to just make sure the couple is appropriate for EFT. Um, and typically this initial assessment will include one, first a joint couple session, then some individual sessions, and then a return to regular ongoing conjoint sessions. So in the conjoint session, you're assessing for both the perceptions of problems in the relationship as well as strengths. You're looking for both the negative and positive interaction cycles. You're looking for looking at the key relationship history and key events, including those attachment in, injuries. And you're getting a very brief attachment history for each partner. Then typically, if all looks good there, they would uh, move on to an individual session. You can take one session divided in half or have two full you know, one hour sessions with, with each. But you're assess assessing for you know, each partner's commitment to the relationship the uh, potential for you know, past or current affairs. You're trying to get a, a trauma history as well as a detailed attachment history, screening for violence and such, but just overall making sure that they are appropriate for the EFT process. So there are contraindications to EFT. So this means, you know, and through the assessment, if a therapist discovers uh, some of these key elements that the they would not proceed with EFT. So EFT is not for every couple that walks in the door. So one is if the couple has different agendas for the relationship and therapy. So if one uh, member of the couple is really ready to end the relationship or mostly out the door, this may not be an appropriate treatment for them. This takes someone who's really committed because you have to be vulnerable and that takes a, a high level of commitment. Yeah, so couples who are, um, have very different agendas for the relationship or therapy or who are really in the process of committing, people, well, I'm not sure, maybe I'll give it one last try, but I don't think there's much of a chance. That's probably not it. And they're the right couple for this because this does require quite a bit of c commitment from both parties. Um, if there's any type of physical or even emotional abuse, then EFT would not, is not indicated as well as if there's an untreated addiction of, uh, for one or both partners, that also would not be an appropriate treatment for those couples. And so the therapist really needs to, doesn't just jump right in and start with EFT, but make sure that the couple is well suited and appropriate for the treatment. So once the um, therapist has assessed the couple, then the next process is to set the goals for treatment. Now, as an evidence-based treatment, EFT has some uh, very basic, consistent, overarching goals, because after all, most of the people using this approach are using it uh, for uh, the, the similar population. So the first is to create a, a strong, secure attachment for both partners. Uh, the second uh, overarching goal is to develop new interaction patterns that are nurturing and supportive for each partner. And the third basic goal is to increase direct expression of emotion, especially those related to attachment needs. So those are direct expression of primary emotions. So next we're going to talk about interventions in EFT, the doing. So as an evidence-based treatment, the uh, link between uh, specific goals and interventions are is much closer than many other approaches, and there are actually certain interventions that are used in each phase and some of them are used differently across phases. So in this early phase of intervention when you're de-escalating and identifying the uh, problem interaction cycle there's a lot of validation of each person's experience and their emotions. There's a lot of reflecting on emotion, of emotions and helping clients identify both the secondary and the primary emotions. There is a lot of tracking of the cycle and um, this can be done in multiple ways. This is where I, this is my, uh, where my insight as to realizing that there is a quite a bit of flexibility. Uh, if you look at other systemic approaches, many of them are more limited. And, and in EFT, they don't care if you track the interactional cycle, you know, on a single event, on a, you know, general hypothetical event or a typical event. So, but they're just tracking the cycle. You can do it more behaviorally. You can do it with circular questions. You can do it more solution-oriented using the video talk questions. 
You can do it any way that makes you happy and makes the couple happy as long as you're tracking that full cycle just like you do in all the others from basic homeostasis, rise in tension, the conflict or symptom, and then how they get back to homeostasis again. And so you're tracking that cycle, whatever it looks like, and you can do it behaviorally, and then you will certainly, at one, in one of your passes through the cycle, look at the interaction of the secondary emotions, and then ultimately the goal is to go through and track how the primary emotions are um, underlying this cycle. Evocative responding is responding in a way that evokes uh, deeper emotions, often primary emotions. And then empathetic conjecture is where you might um, offer up in a tentative way, you know, might you have been feeling rejected at that point when you were looking so angry? And so that empathetic conjecture is used to help clients identify um, both their primary and secondary emotions. Then in the working phase, again, you're going to see um, these, are, this is used, these are interventions that are used to restructure their interactions. So again, you're seeing that evocative responding, responding in a way that gets them, uh, evokes emotion and helps them to get in touch with their emotions. The empathetic conjecture, helping them to identify by tentatively uh, one, you know, putting out some possibilities for the emotions that might be both primary and secondary emotions that might be fueling the interactions, heightening emotions, helping when clients um, indicate there's something there to help heighten and help them express that, reframing um, what their emotions, often using uh, primary emotions as a way to reframe and or the interaction cycles, and then restructuring interactions. And so this would be uh, using very much the enactments that are familiar to us from structural family therapy, but specifically focusing on restructuring the interactions to keep them engaged and to help them uh, get in touch with and directly express um, their more primary emotions that are fueling these inter negative interaction cycles. And then finally in the closing phase, there's again a lot of validation, this time often uh, validating the new interactional patterns that they're developing, using again evocative responding, using reframing to help them understand these new patterns, and again restructuring uh, interactions for more positive interactions between the uh, couple or family. And so finally we're going to uh, close by talking about diversity uh, considerations when working uh, with EFT as well as the evidence base. So EFT has been studied on a range of ethnically diverse couples. It, it generally, the basic premises are used across uh, diverse couples. Research has not indicated that different protocols are necessarily required for different um, ethnicities. And in general, attachment needs have been found to be universal across uh, the theory and across cultures in terms of just studying attachment needs. Uh, across cultures, and but cultural norms generally have very specific rules for how to handle emotional expression, and so therapists need to be uh, very well aware of the expressional expression norms for both males and females within the client's cultural group to you know accurately assess what's going on and how to best help them um, reconnect, and so. You know, the therapist may need to be at work, and when working with diverse clients, identifying specific cultural meanings and functions of various expressions and also for attachment behavior. So even though the need for attachment is uh, cross-culturally documented, how that gets done and how attachment happens across cultures can look very different. And there have been special studies um, working with uh, same-sex couples. So EFT has been researched for, for almost three decades, and it's one of two empirically validated couples therapy approaches. So it's very highly regarded as an evidence-based treatment. Um, in clinical trials, um, or in Sue Johnson's research, they have a very impressive uh, 70 to 73 percent recovery rate for distressed couples in 10 to 12 sessions, with 90 percent of couples showing significant improvement. That is extremely impressive, especially if you ever worked with couples. Once you work with your first few, you'll be even more impressed. And to be fair, this is not typical um, in the sense of the, these are highly trained EFT therapists, uh, what the studies have been conducted on. But still, even with more average trained uh, people in the field, 
the recovery and improvement rates um, just take a little bit more time, more like 20 sessions, but still that is extremely impressive uh, in, in the area and the realm of couples treatment. And like I said, if you haven't worked with a couple yet, it's more impressive the more you do it. Uh, and what's interesting is that the couple's initial level of a stress doesn't seem to matter as much as their level engagement in the session or the male partner's level of trust in general. So those are two of the indicators they have found, which is, again, kind of surprising and counterintuitive. You would think the more distressed couples would take longer to treat. Not necessarily so. It's the more engaged, the more willing the couple is, um, especially the male partner, to engage in the addressing these attachment needs, uh, the more quickly the couple responds. And uh, there are, uh, so nearly two-thirds of the couples resolving uh, attachment inju injuries are able to do um, so with a brief intervention, which is quite uh, Im impressive and important, and the results do tend to be uh, stable. So in terms of using, there is a special protocol you can read about using EFT with attachment injuries. Again, a very um, positive outcomes. And again, it's, you know, they have a very sp specific treatment and it is for a specific type of problem and population. But overall, EFT is a very well-respected couples approach that has very impressive um, outcomes in, in the, considered within the world of mental health. So hopefully this was a useful and helpful introduction to EFT for you and I encourage you um, to, to do further reading. There are more details, obviously, in the chapter.